glad that we can resume our uh, uh, Wednesday evening studies. Uh, let's uh, request Praveen to lead us in a prayer and then we'll get into the study. Father, we are in your presence, Lord, with the attitude of gratitude for providing us another opportunity to come and join with our brethren and to study our word, Lord, especially as we are going to uh, study the church history, Lord. I pray that you may help us understand uh, how we have reached to the faith that we have today and uh, we may learn the good lessons that may teach us about uh, Christian living and uh, tes testifying your name and the gospel of lord lord as pastor dan is teaching us i pray for your special grace upon him so that we may be able to hear your voice and we ask for your anointing upon all of us so that we may be able to perceive and receive the, the truth that you want to reveal it to us lord thank you so very much for listening to us lord i pray that uh, the one hour we are going to spend discussing uh, uh, we ask for your leading, Lord, and our discussions and our words may uh, may mutually edify us, Lord. Lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, uh, let me see. Uh, I just noticed that my brother Bobby has joined us. Some of you will remember him. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, Bobby, you might know Bertie. Bertie is with us. And uh, Mr. Sanjeeva Rao. And uh, Surya Murthy. Your brother? That's correct, yes. Oh, how nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, let's uh, proceed with uh, our study today. As you probably noticed, I put the title as Monasticism. And uh, the question I want to pursue uh, discussing that is, should Christians become monk, monks? You know, should, how should we look at it in this day and age? A couple of weeks back, we were looking at the Crusades. And uh, as we looked at, of course, the split before that into Western and Eastern Christianity. Uh, then, of course, we studied the Crusades. We had completed 1,000 years of church history, uh, right from the beginning of uh, the establishment of the church. Amazing how time has gone by. And now we are into the second millennium of uh, looking at history. And I was interested in this because it was, I think, uh, the second millennium that the whole monastic uh, movement took uh, greater, you know, precedence. So what I'm planning to do again, as usual, is to give you some thoughts on the practice, uh, the history, and then we will get into a discussion on these questions. All right. Okay. Um, so monasticism in, in it, you know, in the uh, second millennium started becoming popular, even though it started even previous to that. Even in the early first millennium, oh, we have records of those who, uh, you know, <clears throat> practiced this kind of a discipline. Uh, just to define it, Christian monasticism is the devotional practice of Christians who live ascetic and typically cloistered lives dedicated to Christian worship. All right, so it is uh, uh, separating oneself from mainstream, li mainstream life and uh, becoming ascetic or, uh, you know, uh, embracing a hermit type of life and then uh, dedicating one's life to worship or a few other things that we will discuss. The word monk originated from the Greek monakos, which means alone, mono means alone. And so uh, many who started in this particular discipline, uh, you know, separated themselves and went away into the wilderness or to the desert to live solitary lives and for just an academic purpose, 
these who, those who live, you know, all alone by themselves, like a hermit, are called eremitic, you know, uh, monks. But later, there were those who, some of them, came together and formed communities to further their ability to observe an ascetic life. These people who formed communities and lived by themselves are called cenobite, you know, once again for uh, just a technical term uh, to classify those who lived in communities and the earlier one which I mentioned were those who lived all alone. Um, just to quote a historian, uh, Robert Louis Wilkin, he says, by creating an alternate social structure within the church, they laid the foundations for one of the most enduring Christian institutions. So uh, even today, we do have monasteries, uh, functioning monasteries, and there are uh, new expressions of this particular discipline, even in the Protestant evangelical, you know, uh, group. Uh, so we will uh, briefly mention about that as we come along. All right. Having just uh, given you a, a snapshot of what monasticism is, uh, let's look at some history. Um, obviously, you know, monasticism, as we know it, predates Christianity. Christianity is not just the only religion where you had, you know, mon monasteries. Uh, many other religions had their versions of monasticism, especially uh, the, um, you know, the, the Buddhistic perspective, you know, the, the, those who follow Buddhism, uh, even though they don't believe in a, in a deity or a god, did have these kinds of expressions uh, where they had their own monastic uh, lifestyle. And of course, even today, they, they continue with that. All right. The f uh, in terms of Christianity and maybe uh, the way they borrowed this particular thought maybe was um, some of the groups such as the Essenes. Uh, these were Jewish, you know, ascetics who separated themselves and lived in communities. We also have the what is called the therapeutic. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, these were also Jewish ascetics and they were apparently healers. And I'm presuming the word therapeutic probably gives rise to therapeutic, which you know, has something to do with healing. These are all dated you know, 10 BC and before. And these people followed lifestyles that could be seen as precursors to Christian monasticism. Uh, now, moving on in the first century, right into the fourth, let's see, the fourth century, Christianity, you remember, was legalized by Constantine. And uh, when Christianity was, you know, legalized, persecution stopped, uh, people started taking it easy, even though there was a large Christian community in the uh, Byzantine in the, in, the, in, the, in the Byzantine Empire. People without the persecution, you know, they started living easy lives, resulted in cultural permissiveness. Uh, morality began to slide. Vice was tolerated. People became irreligious. Piety was abandoned. And of course, uh, with uh, the mix of politics, you know, obviously corruption began to, uh, you know, multiply. And so when Christianity started going through its problems after it was legalized, uh, there were some who were very, very upset because of what was happening, uh, especially the moral decline. And they decided to separate themselves and uh, in the fourth century, that was one uh, reason why that gave rise to the monastic lifestyle. Many of these people fled to the deserts, especially the Egyptian deserts, and they began to be called the Desert Fathers, another technical uh, 
uh, terminology for, you know, uh, in this particular subject. So they used to live all alone in the deserts. And so they were called desert fathers. And what was the motivation that they, uh, that made them do this? Obviously it was deep awareness of one's own sinfulness and a consuming quest for holiness. Now, some, some tend to, you know, uh, say that maybe this movement offered some protection from, you could say, profligate Christianity. Uh, at least some people separated to preserve Christianity in its purity. And so some people surmise that maybe that could be a reason. Uh, we have some protection or rather the continuation of Christianity uh, as we know it. All right, looking again at some history, the head of a monastery, these are the communal uh, <clears throat> monks, came to be known, I mean, they were called father in, the, in Syriac, Abba, which then came to be known as Abbot. And so the head of a monastery is, <clears throat> as we know it in English, is, uh, is called an Abbot. <clears throat> Who are some of the famous uh, monks, you know, through history? And we can first mention Saint Anthony of Egypt, who apparently left civilization behind to live on a solitary Egyptian mountain in the third century. This is, of course, even before uh, Constantine. So uh, some history, some historical records say that he may have been one of the first Christian monks, or rather who started the monk monasticism as such. Then, of course, if you move into the fourth century, you have uh, you know, the mother, as, as she's called, Mother Syncletica of Alexandria, who gave away all her wealth. She was a very wealthy person, chose to reside in a crypt. A crypt is a chamber, you know, wholly or partly underground. Uh, sometimes it is dug into the church floor, and some people decided to live in areas like that. I've also heard that some people would go to uh, some, you know, room in a in a uh, church, you know, building, and lock themselves up for years and years. And so, uh, this is how, you know, monasticism began uh, to be practiced in those days. All right, then of course, um, it spread to Europe. Uh, and we have the name Saint Benedict of uh, Nursia, who uh, I'm sure you will know, formed the Benedictine order. Uh, he was the one who formalized this monasticism. Uh, and he wrote the rules with regards to how somebody who wants to live a monastic life uh, will have to follow. Uh, they had to take vows, which is lifelong commitment, fidelity, obedience, poverty, chastity. These were all the, you know, uh, conditions for accepting the uh, order according, or the Benedictine order, you could say, who started this. St. Francis of Assisi is another famous name, who was a mist, uh, who practiced mystic contemplation. He was the one who used silence a lot, uh, you know, who uh, believed that through silence, you can hear God, you can commune with God. <clears throat> he started the begging order or the bendicant order, as it is says. And he promoted poverty as a vehicle to holiness. So he lived a very simple life. Uh, and uh, basically formalized, you know, uh, living in poverty. So that is some of the history I've brought, I've just, uh, you know, penned down to share with you. There is much more that you can, you know, look at, but I don't want to clutter, uh, you know, the study with uh, too many details. You can, I'm just whetting your appetite. You can go and have a look at it and look at all the other names that are mentioned. But I want to go now to what were the practices of the monks? 
all right? First and foremost, it was isolation, all right? They, they believed in isolating themselves or separating themselves from the world, basically to avoid temptation. So that was one of the, uh, you know, uh, reasons why they would get into this kind of a lifestyle. They believed in renouncing all creaturely comforts, uh, like, for, for example, living in poverty, as we mentioned with regards to St. Francis. Uh, they would believe in begging for, you know, food and for basic sustenance. And talking about begging, you know, we have uh, here in Hyderabad, we have uh, sisters of, what is it called, Franklin? Uh, so sisters of the little poor, no, little sisters of the poor, right? Uh, uh, we have an order here and we know a, a nun there who is uh, her sister Kathleen and she comes every once in about two months to our home and uh, she she's, uh, literally says, I've come to beg <laughs> and they give us some money so that they can feed the elderly. All right, so begging was one of the you know, aspects of this particular lifestyle. Self-denial, uh, denying themselves any kind of comfort. And they, of course, some of them took it too far. For example, there was one Simeon stylites. The word stylite is actually the word for pillar. I think it's in Greek. He was called the pillar hermit. In other words, he decided to live on a pillar, you know, on a long pillar. And apparently this is uh, back in 423 BC, uh, no, not BC, but CE, that is AD, 423, till his death, he stayed on that pillar and apparently it was 37 years. I keep wondering, you know, how do they do their normal jobs <laughs> living on a pillar? It's uh, quite a self-denial, I would say. Now, so uh, renouncing all creaturely uh, uh, comforts was one of those, uh, uh, you know, things that they believed in. Devotion to prayer, you know, lots of prayer. They would spend hours and hours just praying. Uh, and it is said that another monk, Abba Arsenius, as he's called, would lift up his hands in prayer at sundown Saturday not resting them until the glory of Sunday had shone on him. In other words, Saturday sundown to Sunday uh, uh, sunrise, he would be with his arms stretched out praying. So that's the kind of devotion that these people uh, would display. So lots of prayer. Uh, that is another practice of these monks. Uh, with talking about prayer, there is something called the Hesychasm, which is a monastic system that seeks to achieve divine quietness by reciting the Jesus prayer. Have you heard of the Jesus prayer? Uh, the Jesus prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And that phrase is repeated again and again and again, thousands upon thousands of times. They keep repeating it because they believe that they get some kind of absolution if they repeat that prayer. So that is called the, uh, the hesychasm or the Jesus prayer. Another practice of the monks were what is called as the uh, lectio, uh, uh, lectio divina and study, which means that you must prayerfully and meditatively read scri sacred script uh, scripture. So lecto, uh, lecto divina is basically reading scripture uh, in, a, in a meditative manner and a prayerful manner. They will read, they will pray, they will read again. And that way they believe they will get some illumination into the scriptures. Silence is another big uh, uh, you know, practice. And uh, they believe that the attentive listening to God in our hearts requires an internal attitude of silence and an external environment of stillness. So they will spend hours just completely remaining silent and hoping that they would hear God. Uh, one name that comes to mind, and I have heard, heard him, 
uh, you know, some of his lectures. Uh, Richard Rohr, I don't know if you've heard of that name, but he is quite a famous chap. Uh, he is, uh, I think, a Franciscan monk, uh, but a modern one. And he um, believes in the silence quite a bit. Uh, but some of his thoughts and teachings are very interesting. If you have an opportunity, maybe you can have a look at that. All right. Then fasting. Fasting is another practice. Some people will go days upon days of fasting. Some people will eat very little and call it a fasting. In other words, very, very subsist subsistence level, you know, nutrition. And then they will um, uh, that way, you know, deny themselves. Some, of course, uh, some monasteries, you know, move into social service for co the community, uh, teaching to spread the faith. And so they've got uh, in, in more in the modern times, uh, these kind of things uh, have now taken place. I must mention before we move out of this, there was also something called military monasticism. And uh, if you remember during the, I mean to say in our study about the Crusades, uh, we studied about how some, uh, you know, uh, soldiers who dedicated themselves to the Christian cause would come together and then, of course, answer the call of the Pope and go and fight wars. And so military monasticism is something that started, I would say, uh, in the, in the um, just after, well, during the Crusades. So it is uh, in the second millennium. Um, so these group of dedicated warrior monks, they are called, uh, who achieved spiritual merit through waging war. So they believed that they would get spiritual merit by waging war. And these, of course, some of the names, uh, these orders included the Knights Templar and the Hospitallers. Hospitallers. These were some of the most common ones that we can find in history. And of course, I shouldn't forget to mention that uh, monasteries and monks were very good at making good wine. You know, by cultivating grapes at monasteries, uh, monks ensured that they had access to wine. And what was that for? Because they needed to perform mass, uh, the communion. So they needed wine. And so they made a little extra and, of course, enjoyed uh, some very fine wines. I was in, it was very interesting to note that uh, some of you might remember there is a very famous uh, brand of champagne called Dom Perignon. And uh, uh, this is a brand of vintage champagne. It is named after Dom Perignon, a Benedictine monk who was an important quality pioneer for champagne wine. So this man was a wine taster <laughs> and made what is today called Dom Perignon, all right? Okay, that is what I wanted to present. I do want to give you my take on the question that I'm going to pose. So we are now ready for some discussion. Here is a question I'd like to pose and get your thoughts. Uh, feel free to comment uh, on any of the points that I mentioned. If you should have any questions, feel free to ask. If you can add something to what I know, what I have researched, uh, feel free to do so. Here is a question. The key question is, how does renunciation or isolation, separation relate to the gospel? Is it a form of self-salvation? Is it works of righteousness, an atonement, uh, an atonement for sin based on denial of the self? So all of these practices, uh, how do we how do we understand them? How can we term a uh, term? I mean, to say, how can we understand them from what we know from Scripture? Is it a legitimate form of repentance, uh, an essential preparation for joy? Because you're denying yourself now, so that you can you can experience joy in the in 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 salvation. And some and one of the key scriptures, many of these. Uh, monks would use is Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus says, uh, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake 
will find it. Okay, the floor is open now. I'd like some of your thoughts, questions, feel free to uh, come in with uh, your comments. And a uh, little later, I will give you my take and then we will conclude. All right, go ahead. Yes, Surimurthy, go ahead. Make sure you unmute yourself. Overall, it appears that God never intended human beings to lead this monkey life. You're saying that God never intended for this, this kind of uh, yes. uh, practice? Yes, okay. monkey. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by that, but uh, I'm, uh, you know, if you want to explain, you can go ahead. Otherwise, uh... the life of a monk. Oh, monk. Okay, <laughs> I, I I mistook it for monkey as in terms of an animal. <laughs> can you hear me, uh, Daniel? Can you hear me? Yeah, Bobby, go ahead. No, I mean the whole foundation of it is you know salvation by works. And it's very much a Catholic tradition, and it, most of this started. I mean, for, for, forget the the Jewish ascetics, etc. It's very much, you know, something that the Catholic Church, uh, no. and and the whole thing about self punishment. I mean, there's a lot of practices other than just being, uh, you know, an ascetic. There is also a lot of things about punishing yourself physically and mentally. I mean, sitting on top of a pillar. I mean, has a lot of punishment attached to it. So the whole thing is founded founded on this works thing, trying to work your salvation and trying to compel God to grant you grace and salvation. I think, uh, yeah, that is absolutely right, especially from our grace-based understanding of salvation. Uh, salvation is not of works, but of grace. Any Any other thoughts that the others would like to venture? Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Um, as you know, uh, we are the called out ones, and uh, we're called out, uh, called out from the world into the body of Christ. We we confess that we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We have just observed our annual convention, festival convention, which speaks about freedom in Christ, freedom into Christ. Uh, when, 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 we, when we clearly know that when we turn to the Lord, that is, we make a change or we, uh, we, uh, we confess we are sinners and we, uh, a change of lifestyle, a changing, a, a change of mind, uh, what, what we call is, as repentance. We, and we take a, a genuine, a genuine uh, repentance, genuine baptism. It pictures the that clearly shows that, and the Bible also says we are, we are baptized into Christ's death. And as Christ was raised from the grave by the glory of the Father, we to rise to live a new life. And that way we come under uh, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So when we come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we rely on the Lord. Our, uh, even uh, we were uh, in all the messages at the convention we heard. When we are the Lord doesn't, law was... Uh, 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 you know, it was uh, what you call embodiment of godliness and you know uh, goodness, the law. But if I can, if I can just interject, Bertie, uh, you said we come under the lordship of Christ. Are you yes. saying then it is not required for us to do any of this? Uh, you know, um, practices. Uh, no, no, to, not, to... not mentioning about not doing it. I'm saying the first thing we should come to know that we of ourselves. As uh, Bobby just mentioned, you know, uh, um, you know, self punishment or certain practices, and uh, which you have mentioned, and maybe others as, as Bobby is knowing, or its practice in the Catholic Church, or, or maybe other other denominations, they try to do it as he says. We do it, try to do it by works. Uh, yeah. That work, and we, as we know, we have been delivered from that. We know the Lord says, apart from me, can do nothing. And we need to be clothed with Christ's righteousness. Now, Christ has, Christ is the uh, truly what is called made, uh, you know, uh, uh, flesh and blood, uh, first uh, human being made 
in the image and he has completed that uh, in the image and likeness of God, which Adam and Eve failed, you know, to relate themselves uh, as God rightly would want us to relate. Jesus Christ did it in okay. his life and then he died for our sins so that we are brought into Christ. And that's why it calls in Isaiah mentioned in, repent, in returning or in return or in turning or in, uh, in, yeah, in returning and rest, will you be saved? Yeah, rest, correct. we get that rest in us, you know. That's why the Bible says love, joy, peace, and other things come. So we should be, we should be acutely, uh, uh, acutely, uh, you know, knowing or you know, reminding ourselves that we need to be, need to have Christ. We are a new creation in Christ. I don't say that uh, we should not practice. Some some people still practice the Sabbath, and I for one, I for one, for one, I would like to, you know, keep aside. At 24, I'm not telling the church should my myself personally, where I know I don't uh, uh, don't want to do it. Like you know, the Sabbath, which is supposed to be a sign between uh, between God and Israelite. Now Jesus Christ is a Sabbath, so we should be having and uh, we should be experiencing the love, joy, and peace, trusting in Him. I'm not saying that we should not practice any of the thing that you're saying. Yeah, uh, some, some of the practices are extreme. <laughs> got you, got you, buddy. Yes, and I know that. Uh... You know, when you mentioned the Sabbath practice uh, and you have sacrificed a great deal because of that. And uh, we, we salute you for that. Thank you for mentioning. But yes, I, we got your point. Um, Christ ultimately is the one who frees us, not any of our works. Surimurti, you had a thought? Uh, just uh, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Jesus Christ said, <clears throat> that we should have life abundantly, an abundant life, not a life of self-denial. <laughs> All right, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, but the abundant life at this time, in this day and age, will also include sometimes persecution, sometimes suffering. Uh, the abundant life, of course, we are moving into it, the fullness of the kingdom. But yes, uh, uh, I don't think God would want us to, you know, suffer the way uh, uh, these people are advocating. Franklin, you had a thought. Sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Sir, <clears throat> sir uh, the biblical, the practices of monasticism has no biblical backings. Okay. For example, sir, uh, one of the practices is to live a poor life and ask for uh, arms. Am I correct, sir? Begging is one of the practices. Yes. No, sir. That, that is that is anti. Uh, in my judgment, sir, that, is, that doesn't the Bible doesn't teach that. For example, no, sir, the apostle Paul, sir, himself, sir, when he was involved in ministry, he was still working as a tent maker. Okay. The apostle Paul, he said, "I don't want to be a burden to anybody. Uh, you have to go and work." Uh, you can't live on on a, do, what you call so Americans call doles. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, there's one there's one more one more problem, sir. Hmm. Some of the practices are in the monasticism is contrary, sir. Sir, one like of the what? practices says uh, you should live a life of ice. So it says you have to live a life of isolation. And then another uh, practice says go on to social service. If you are going to live in isolation, how can you go into the society and serve? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, those who live in isolation obviously will not do social service. Uh, but there are orders that completely de uh, dedicate themselves to social service. So, uh, right. But anyway, uh, your points are well taken, Franklin. Thank you. Any other thoughts or... Uh, Comments you like to make? Yes, Bertie, please unmute yourself. It's true that when we are God Himself says it will go well with the righteous, or uh, the righteous are blessed. Uh, as Surimuthi said, it could be uh, could be in richness, could be you know not in richness, but definitely not begging. Definitely not. God says. All the God says, even David uh, said, I've been young and I'm old, yet I've never seen, seen a, 
uh, you know, the righteous begging or seed, uh, or the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread is ever merciful and lends and his seed is blessed after him. And uh, another thing I would like to say is God says, never said it could be the keep way. Uh, God has already said, you know, broad and wide is the way to, uh, is the road to destruction. Many there be that enter there at. But uh, because the um, because the road is narrow and straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, straight, difficult, and few are there that enter therein. Another place says those who will live godly lives in this world will, will have persecutions. So we have to have, you know, take it in the right, you know, we are living in a fallen world. We have to take it in the right sense. Right. But uh, let me say that that following the truth, and God says his paths are mercy and truth. Uh, for all those who, it's given in Proverbs, all his paths are mercy and truth to them that uh, keep his covenant and testimonies. And so there are many blessings, answers to prayers and healing, deliverance, what, you know, because God is our father, he is our creator, and uh, he's molding us uh, into Christ. But the thing is, we have to be truly in Christ. That's what is called you know, the bottom line. We, apart from Christ, uh, we can't follow false Christ, yeah. Okay, well, at the bottom line. <laughs> Thank you, Bertie. Let me just quickly then uh, just share some more thoughts and then, uh, you know, as we come closer to the end, um, just give you some of my thoughts on this. Uh, the monastic tradition, some people say, uh, for defending it, apparently was inspired not mandated, they don't say it's mandated, like some of you already mentioned, uh, but inspired by Elijah, the prophet who lived, you know, in a cave, John the Baptist, who lived, you know, uh, away from mainstream society as such. They even quote Jesus 40 days fast in the wilderness. Uh, though they quote these things, I would agree that uh, there is no way that the Bible promotes such a practice where somebody goes off into isolation. All right, it doesn't promote that. It is not against it, but it doesn't promote that. Uh, rules that have been laid down by these monasteries and uh, by these different orders obviously seem to be extra biblical. And we don't see anywhere where it is mandated in scripture. And uh, once again, just to, uh, you know, uh, echo some of your thoughts, self-atonement is not taught in scripture. Only Christ's atonement matters. Uh, our atonement, you know, does not save us. It is Christ who saves us, right? Galatians, I'd just like to read you Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, where it says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So by doing the works of the law, you're not justified then how can you be justified by doing extra biblical laws? You know, laws that you yourself form you and obviously doesn't make uh, much sense there. Uh, I just want to quote Martin Luther, who, you know, the reformer who had a thought on this. He says, monastic vows rest on the false assumption that there is a special calling, a vocation to which superior Christians are invited to observe the counsels of perfection while ordinary Christians fulfill only the commands. But there simply is no special religious vocation since the call of God comes to each at the common tasks. In other words, he's saying you, you should not separate Christianity into some special calling and, uh, uh, you know, an ordinary calling. Uh, and uh, these monks believe that their special calling makes them have to do these things. Uh, that is dividing Christianity, bringing a wedge between uh, Christians. And that is, uh, I think, rightly said by Luther. Just to, just to bring in Paul now, the Apostle Paul, in Colossians chapter 2, uh, he says, Why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules are based on merely human commands and teachings. 
such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgences. I mean, that is, a, <laughs> that is spot on, right? The Apostle Paul uh, saying that, you know, the harsh treatment of the body does not gain much because Paul was opposed to these practices because they were ineffective in producing true holiness because the real problem is internal. You know, it is had to do with the heart. And that's why the prophets call, talk about having a new heart. And someday we will all have that new heart where we will not have any problem with temptation and all of those things, all right? Now, even as we say that, we cannot deny the fact that some good has come from this movement, all right? Um, for example, monasteries have encouraged literacy, uh, promoted learning, and preserved the classics of ancient literature. And if you remember the Qumran uh, ascetic movement, you know, copying of scripture uh, dated 150 BC, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are from Qumran, where they wrote out scripture and, you know, preserved it in those, uh, uh, in those jars. Uh, so we can't deny that there is some good that has come, but obviously we have to temper this whole thing with what we have already mentioned. I um, uh, also would like to mention that we are very clearly taught in scripture that we are to, Christians are to engage with the world, Right. Uh, we are, of course, told not to be, uh, you know, not to, I mean, we are in the world, but not to be of it, right? Uh, because we are supposed to be, though we are in the world, we are supposed to be salt and light of the world, as Jesus said. And one more thought, when we bring our Trinitarian perspective, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the very essence of Father, Son, Holy Spirit is love. And what is love? Love is sharing. <laughs> Love is outgoing otherness, you know, concern for the otherness. Uh, it is not isolation. Father, Son, Holy Spirit don't isolate themselves. They always live in community. And so um, from a Trinitarian perspective, obviously this practice of isolation then can, you know, we can put a big question mark on that. Uh, let me quickly end by saying that today, this day and age, there is something called the new monasticism. And this is starting amongst Protestants and evangelicals. Apparently, they, they are many, many orders are coming up among evangelicals and uh, Protestants, where they invite people to leave their homes, to leave their, you know, lifestyles, to come and live in commune type situations. Where and, and enjoy a simpler lifestyle. Uh, they say rather than seeking to get ahead, uh, they want people to identify with the underprivileged and then to dedicate their lives to service. And so there is some kind of a new monasticism, you know, beginning to emerge, especially in the Protestant world. All right. That is all I have for, for you. Uh, we will open it up for some more. We have just a few minutes left. Let's open it up for some more thoughts. Bertie, you can go ahead. Uh, the retreats, uh, you, uh, we all have heard of the retreats that uh, uh, these churches uh, organize where you are, they go, go to a particular place and, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, apart from, you know, it's, it's not the, uh, their normal day-to-day -day life, but they are, they have retreated. Retreat. They go to a place where more uh, more time is spent in uh, in yeah. the word, more time is spent in prayer, in maybe even fasting, or maybe you know just uh, modest eating. But it's you know a couple of days, a day or two, or maybe even more. They retreat, uh, and uh, would that be? Uh, well, I think that is uh, uh, quite a, quite an effective thing. Uh, I feel uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not uh, again it's not mandated by the bible right. uh, but um, uh, you know it's helpful 
Yeah, I guess uh, well, what you're saying is interesting, Bertie. Uh, I, I'm presuming that's more for, you could say, like recharging your batteries, uh, you know, to uh, get uh, a refreshment. I don't think people do that with the, with the uh, goal of trying to go for, you know, repenting or uh, thinking that they are doing some kind of a penance to receive absolution or to receive you know, forgiveness from God, you, you know, you can do nothing to uh, yeah. receive forgiveness from God. It's a free gift that God offers. So yes, I think those kind of retreats are more in terms of like a, you know, like a holiday that we take, uh, I'm sure is, is quite helpful, but without not getting into the um, other aspects of uh, monasticism. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, Mr. Mr. Bertie gave an excellent point, sir. Yeah. Uh, begging is not a is not a Christian principle. What is uh, not let a Christian principle? Substantiate what Bertie said, sir. Begging, begging, okay. begging, begging for food is not a Christian principle. Uh, let me substantiate what Bertie said. Sir. Psalms thirty-seven, uh, sir, verse twenty-five and twenty-six. Uh, I'm not sure if it is a David, King David. I have been young and now I'm old, and have I uh, have I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lended, and his seed is blessed. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, uh, to to uh, deliberately live a lifestyle of begging. I would think uh, there is a problem there. But then on the other hand, if I can just mention this, the Bible tells us we have to be generous. We have to give, we have to be giving. So those who receive, are they begging? <laughs> Just a thought I want to plant in your mind. You know, I mean, we are told to be generous, but uh, those who receive it, I mean, how do they, how do you look at them? That's not at all, uh, it's not begging at all. Okay. Uh, yeah, even the first century Christians, uh, you know, they, they lived their lives uh, which are more, you know, togetherness, like cooperative lives where uh, you know, <coughs> four, 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 uh, four practices of prayer, you know, breaking of bread, uh, uh, following the doc uh, apostles' doctrines, and in, um, in uh, one more. And uh, this thing is, uh, plus they have things in common. Yeah. And it's a, the example given is the people having lands and uh, like, you know, lands and homes. Even it's clearly mentioned they sold it and brought the money and kept, you know, brought the portion and kept it at the apostle's feet. And it was distributed to whoever was a need, you know, and there was not a person what lacking. I, yeah, what, what you're saying is that is not begging, but that is, uh, you know, living uh, generously towards others, right? Yeah. And in okay. fellowship. God said there'll, ever, there'll always be poor and rich. You said God has created, the proverb says, yeah. uh, the, poor okay. the poor and the rich, you know, and, uh, you know, that way. And, uh, uh, God has given talents to certain people where they use it and, you know, and they're able to uh, be uh, more like, you know, the talent, 10 talents given, you know, shows, uh, you know, they are more, uh, they are more sort of uh, most industri industrious or they're using the talents to, uh, to be, you know, to be, to grow rich. And, uh, but, uh, and, but God always says that the poor should be remembered, you know, yeah. the, the not so rich, I could say. Got it, uh, yeah, so got it. Remember, but definitely none of those things apply to us. Yeah, okay. Christians who, are the, who are following the Lord, none of it. Rather, God says more, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And be, giving, as you said, generosity is a must for God's people. Excellent. Especially, right. especially those who have, those who are able to give, those who are able to give. Right. Thank you. Yes. Any other thoughts from anybody else? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Praveen, go ahead. Yeah, may I share uh, three thoughts in a short form? Sure. Uh, first, my comment towards uh, the so-called <clears throat> this begging thing which we are talking about. This begging is not out of need to survive. This begging is out of, to show and live a life of humility. So these are the people who are very rich. They sold their properties and they have given to poor. And now they are living a life of humility. This begging is not about, they don't want to work and they are lazy. They want to uh, get some kind of uh, sustenance. Uh, 
that is number one. Second thing I wanted to share is uh, uh, institutionally and intellectually, especially the mona, uh, these, uh, these monks who started, they were been completely influenced. Uh, these are highly educated people. I mean, most of them are highly educated people. These are uh, mostly influenced by Greek philosophy. Uh, when Greek philosophy started overtaking Christianity, these uh, it resulted in these kind of forms. Uh, in if you read in the church history, also we find it very much. Uh, Greek philosophy teaches that matter is evil and the flesh is evil. All the fleshly desires and the fleshly needs, uh, the needs that we have for the body is evil. So we have to punish our body and beat our body, and we have to overcome only reality is something beyond physical. So that is the very reason these people are completely denying the physical needs and physical reality of life. So intellectually, this is a Greek philosophy, which is overtaking Christianity. Uh, that is the reason they are following these. And not only these, whatever the practices which we have heard from about uh, um, uh, monks and all, these are followed among uh, uh, Greek philosophers also. There are Greek religious people. Uh, you might have heard about... Um, uh, one group is Epicureans, the other group is, uh, Gnostics, you'll, is find, uh, you'll find in First John actually, who tell us to deny everything. So th there are two phases for these Greek philosophy, phases for these Greek philosophy, like the two sides of the coin. One teaches that uh, we have to live in absolute purity. The other teaches we have to live completely in um, uh, denial. So this is uh, this is other thing. One side is la living uh, a lavish and a lavish life like the Greek gods and also since matter is evil, you cannot change it. Go live however you want. That's where Epicureans have come. And the other group is denying themselves and this kind of thing has come. So my uh, institutionally, this is the uh, influence of the Greek philosophy in the early Christianity. And next thing is, it is not just an institutional problem, but it is a psychological problem. Uh, we all humans, we feel, though we accept the grace of God and all, we still have somewhere deep within us, uh, we believe that there is no free lunch. There is something we have to do. And we have to, Christ, we Christians have taken uh, a different path. In other words, we have been deviated from true spirituality. True spirituality leads us, makes us relational. Uh, because of God is relation, God of relationships, and we are we are called into relationship. We are saved into a relationship. So true uh, spirituality leads us towards relationality. But unfortunately, just like any other uh, religion, pagan and heathen, and what all the religions that are around us, uh, we Christianity have taken and we started interpreting spirituality is about moral purity. Spirituality is more about personally, individually, uh, humility and life of denial. The moment we hear a pastor, oh, you're a pastor, so you should be more humble and you should not be having an iPhone in your hand. Example I'm talking about. So uh, the moment we talk about spirituality, we have taken a diversion, thinking this is always about self-denial. We have to live, we should be living suffering and we should be living with minimalistic life and these kind of things have come so this is basically psychological problem we have yeah. we cannot take anything freely so we want to at least god gave us this grace so what can i do for him at least uh, let me hurt myself yeah. or uh, sometimes we ourselves don't feel comfortable when we go and pray to god god said you have forgiven all your sins unless we say 100 times that i am a sinner we don't feel comfortable to pray before god this is also similar to that Okay. And uh, there are a lot of things we do which are very small, but similar to what these uh, people are doing. Like, you know, every Friday is a fasting day. Why are you fasting? We don't know. Because fasting is something spiritual. We have to do it. I'm doing it. This is again, same thing. So we should be careful. Our Christian, our spiritual life should not be, uh, you know, deviated from Focusing on Jesus, scripture says, look unto Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. But what we do in this particular school of thought, uh, in um, in its completeness or in minor minuteness, like what I said, the examples I said, we put our focus on ourselves. 
Am I living pure? Am I living a life of simplicity? Am I living righteously, soberly? Am I living life of denial? Am I living spiritually, which means morally? So this kind of thing, which is taking our attention from Jesus and it is taking our focus from Jesus and putting it on ourselves, which is again, uh, we call we can call it even spiritual adultery, which we are doing it. We can consider that way. So it, it can be an extreme level like these monks and it can be a small level also. So we should be careful to focus our eyes on Jesus. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, some very good points, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, morality has its place. Uh, we don't go and murder our grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, what you, what you said, uh, Praveen, is uh, absolutely very good. I mean, we have the psychological problem that we have to, you know, uh, compensate for, you know, uh, you know, our lifestyle. And so that is very true. Uh, and yes, and then of course the Greek influence uh, very much uh, something that of course affects all religions. All religions have these issues, right? Yeah. Bertie, we'll take your final call, final uh, comment, and then we'll close. Uh, you are on mute, Bertie. Yeah, the Bible, uh, the scriptures in the New Testament mentions the simplicity and sincerity in Christ. Uh, 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 you know, it'll be helpful. Those are helpful watchwords for us. Watchwords, simplicity okay. and sincerity in Christ. You know, now that we are, we have, um, you know, we are brought into Christ. We depend on Christ. Uh, we need help. Without Christ, we are uh, Bible says we are nothing, and uh, we cannot be overcomers as uh, as per say. You know, yeah. We need but, help uh... Who has lived that life, and we. We rest in him. Bible clearly says we have a rest in Christ. Uh, yes. Though though we may be put to trials and right. uh, the ups and downs in life. But the yeah. simplicity, the simplicity you mentioned is very good, uh, Bertie. But of course, it doesn't uh, stop us from having an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm not that. just to make it lighter. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, I think uh, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, we'll do this again next week. Uh, and may I request, uh, Vanessa, would you like to close in prayer? You will have to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, I thank you that you brought each one of us here to have some information to learn about you. We thank Pastor and all the other members who have come here. Bless us, bless our families, our near and dear ones and give us insight into your preachings in what we should do and not do in Lord Jesus Christ, your precious sons, may we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And have a good evening, everyone. God bless you all.